The Lord be with you. The Lord is risen. See, Easter is more than just a day, it's a season. Remember that. Several announcements today. Uh, immediately after the postlude, we will have a congregational meeting to consider the sale of extra property that we own that is way down there. And Charles will show us on the screens where it is exactly and all of that. So don't escape. Kathy Murdoch has an announcement. Last Sunday, we sent Susan off on her retirement adventures. So today, we have a guest organist. His name is Craig Kanzler. He is from this area originally. Uh, there's some information about Craig in the bulletin that you can read at your leisure. But we welcome him to our worship service today and next week, and thank him to, for being here. Thank you. Welcome, Craig. And welcome to all of you online visitors and those of you who are with us today. Please sign the fellowship attendance sheets on the pads. This comes down from the ushers. And by the way, we need more ushers for May. So on your way out, you can sign up on the pad and fight over who gets to be an usher, which day, a lot of competition, I hope. Beth Huggins has one final announcement. Beth.
and let us pray the litany of assurance. By God's great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. This is Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This Jesus is God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. By God's power, we are guarded through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. This Jesus is God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. The trials you may suffer are so that your faith may prove itself worthy of all praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. No gracious words we hear from Christ who spoke as none e'er spoke, but we believe him near. We may not touch his hands and side, no.
right, good morning. I'd like to invite all the children and youth to come up for time for young disciples. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Sean, when you coming down this morning, bud? Come on down, man. Say, Miss Errol, come with you. There you go. Now we're ready. Come on down. <laughs> Good morning. All right, so last Sunday was what special day at church? No, no. close. Easter, thank you from the assist from the crowd. Good job. All right, so after Jesus rose from the dead, he began to appear to his disciples to show them that he had risen from the grave, right? Well, one of his disciples named Thomas wasn't with the disciples that Jesus first visited. And so when the disciples told him, hey, guess what? Jesus is alive. Thomas was like, uh, yeah, right. I'm not going to believe that he's alive until I see the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. Now, do you blame him, though? I mean, we're not really used to people dying and coming back, right? That's usually not how that works, right? So maybe, you know, some of us even doubt that that actually happened. I know there's people in the world who do. But Jesus wasn't upset that Thomas doubted. In fact, when he appeared to Thomas finally, he said, Here, look at my hands, look at my feet. Because he wanted Thomas to believe, right? But he also said, blessed are those who walk by faith and not by sight. Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. That's like Thomas the Train. That's like Thomas the Train. Yes, sir. You got it. You got it. And so, but Jesus wasn't upset. He showed Thomas his wounds. Now, there may be some times where we doubt things. We don't know which way to turn, the next decision to make in life. But you know, just like Thomas, you can take those doubts to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will help you understand and make a good decision, right? Yeah. But you know what? We can take it one step further than that. Because you may meet people who doubt that God is even real. Now, we can't see God or Jesus, but we know they're real, right? We believe in them. And that's called faith, right? So we can show people our faith and our love for God and Jesus by going out and helping others and loving them and teaching them about Jesus, just like Jesus did in his mission, right? Yeah. So this week, I challenge you to go out, and if you have any doubts or questions, take them to Jesus or to your mommy and daddy or pastor or somebody. Because God, I find, sometimes will bring people into your life that help you make those decisions, right? Yeah. All right. So if you're going to blast... You're going to go with Miss Margie. She's coming out of the choir loft. But before we do that, let's say a prayer. All right, you ready? You repeat after me. You ready? All right, here we go. All right. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for allowing us, for allowing us to, come to, you to come to you with our doubts. With our doubts. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. 
And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, so that the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Well, we call him Doubting Thomas. We don't really take him very seriously. We should. Tradition says that he was a faithful missionary who went all the way to India and died there for his faith. And the Mar Thoma Church in India traces its roots to his preaching. When we look at the scripture, this is the story that comes to mind about Thomas. Poor old Thomas, he doubted. We get all moralistic and tell ourselves that no one should doubt. We shouldn't doubt. Don't doubt. Well, what's wrong with some doubt? Huh? Thomas was no different than the other disciples, and he's no different from us. You know, the other disciples, it sort of sneaks it in there, but it says Jesus appeared and said, Peace be with you, and then showed him, showed them his hands inside. So Thomas is not that different from them, and his desire to see for himself and have proof and reserve judgment until he sees the evidence, that's very modern. We don't believe things until we've had a chance to see for ourselves. And if we were placed in Thomas's shoes, we might react exactly the same way, skeptical until the resurrection is proved. And of course, that raises questions for us because we don't have the option of seeing for ourselves. Seeing is believing, they say, but when you don't have any way to see, what do you do? You can't go look at the tomb. You can't see his hands and feet the way they could. Jesus is just not here in that same way. And if somebody says, Jesus appeared to me and I saw, we kind of step back and give them a lot of room. It's not the kind of thing that generally happens. So we would have the same skepticism that Thomas had. But doubt is part of faith. And faith questions, faith moves forward, and faith grows stronger through your doubts. Now, I had a professor once who told this story. He was holding a newspaper when he came into class, and he started reading from the newspaper, and the newspaper said a duck, an ordinary duck, stood up one day, took off running, quacked a few times, flapped its wings twice, and then exploded. 
No one could explain that. It's outlandish, yes. It's just as outlandish as a man who was brutally crucified appearing three days later and saying, peace be with you. We don't believe in exploding ducks without a reason. I mean, if we knew the duck had just swallowed a firecracker, yeah, we'd say, well, yeah, of course. Blew himself up. And the unfortunate duck would not really be noteworthy as firecrackers explode. So explanations rob the event of mystery and the outlandish qualities. But when we look for a way to understand the resurrection, we're stuck. There isn't one. We don't know of any ordinary or scientifically verifiable means to explain the resurrection. If we could do it, if we could explain it, then we could dismiss it. But the resurrection won't be explained and it won't be dismissed. So we come down to this question, do we really believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And what that really asks is, do we believe that Jesus was the Son of God was God incarnate, was the Word made flesh? I mean, I've often wondered how people can say they believe in the resurrection, but not the virgin birth of Jesus. I mean, if you can believe one, the other is not much more difficult, right? If you believe Jesus was God, then both of them are fairly easy. But to believe that he was God, that's the hard part. That's the paradox in Christianity. That's the thing that doesn't make sense. Well, way back in the late second century, Tertullian was a guy who wrote a bunch of big, hard books. And he wrote these words, the son of God died. It is by all means to be believed because it's absurd. And he was buried and rose again. The fact is certain simply because it's impossible. In other words, something as unbelievable as our proclamation of the resurrection has to be true, otherwise we wouldn't proclaim it. Frederick Beekner puts it this way, almost nothing that makes any real difference can be proved. I can prove the law of gravity by dropping a shoe out the window. I can prove that the world is round if I'm clever at that sort of thing. I can prove that the radio works, that light travels faster than sound. I cannot prove that life is better than death or love better than hate. As soon as we know we can prove something, it just becomes more knowledge and kind of ordinary. But the things that matter can't be proved by our logic and science. And so we say we have faith. Just have faith. Just believe it. Believe it by faith. Well, what does that mean? Some people say, well, faith is belief on, based on partial evidence. You can't be sure, but you've got good indicators that kind of point to a conclusion, so you have faith. Certain knowledge is good, faith is less than certain, it's kind of halfway there. And others say, well, faith is an act of the will. You just decide to believe it. You don't have sufficient reasons to believe it, you just believe it anyway. And still others will say, well, faith is all emotion. You know that old line, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Well, all of those are ways of faith, understanding faith, that make it arbitrary and individual. And that's not the biblical understanding of faith. Because faith is not knowledge, it's not emotion, it's not an act of the will. It might include all of those. 
But faith is a basic trust that involves our whole being, our complete self as a commitment. So faith involves passion and risk. It involves knowledge and emotion and willpower. It's a commitment we make with our whole selves, our minds, our bodies, our hearts. And in spite of how strange it sounds, we believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead and is alive now. Now, to say Jesus is alive in that way is different from saying, you know, Elvis is alive. Those who say Elvis is alive suppose that, well, he didn't really die. He just snuck off to Minnesota and lives in a small town. There used to be a song that said, Elvis is alive. I know I saw him in the Safeway with Amelia Earhart just last night. I love that song. Well, Nobody stakes their life on Elvis living or not, but every one of us stake our life on Jesus being alive. And then Jesus says, well, blessed are those who have not seen me and still believe. And that's us. We have not seen Jesus in the flesh, but we believe. We can't explain it all. We don't have all the answers. All we have is the testimony of faithful witnesses written down in the scriptures. But we have our faith as a gift from God. We have our own experience. And we have the sacraments. And all of those speak to us of the reality of Jesus, the living Lord. It's just like baptism, you know. It's a little ridiculous, that sacrament, where we pour a little water on a baby's head. I mean, what does that do? I can go on at great length about what that does, and I'll do that during Sunday school hour. But, I mean, what does it really do? It signifies things, washing away sins and that stuff. But, you know, if you understand baptism the way Paul did... You're buried when you die, and then you rise again. You're buried in the water of baptism, and you come out of it. So it's death and burial. It's a symbol of the resurrection. There's a problem with that, of course. You can't see any of that stuff happening. We ascribe all kinds of meaning to that symbol. Just like when we take the Lord's Supper, we ascribe all kinds of meaning to a little little, tiny bit of bread and a a wee dram of wine. But it's not what we see that matters. It's not what we experience that matters. It's what God has promised that's important. And so the ancient definition of a sacrament, the visible sign of an invisible grace, that's important. God acts in these signs to change us. God takes us as his children. Frederick Buechner again says it this way, Faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. It's a journey without maps. We can't see where the journey will take us. I mean, we don't even use maps anymore. We got the GPS on our phone tells us exactly where to turn, usually about three seconds after we pass the turn, but, you know, tells us we should have turned right there. And I know a guy that had a GPS, and if you disobeyed its instructions for three or four consecutive times, it would say, well, find your own way through life, which I thought was great. But Frederick Buechner says faith is a journey without maps, without the GPS. We don't know where we're going. We don't know. God just says come and we take a step and then we take another step. And then, you know, you just you can't see the goal. You just see 
where to take each step. So, you know, is seeing believing? Yeah. But believing is seeing. Believing, to trust and believe and have faith, leads us to new understandings of God's presence with us in Christ. We begin to perceive what we can't see, the work of the Spirit and the sacraments and in the world of people around us. We begin to be aware of people and, and what God is up to. There's something more at work in life than what the eye can see. There's someone behind the scenes, and that someone is Jesus Christ. And so, finally, we are enabled and empowered to do things and to go where we haven't gone before and attempt brand new ideas and all of that because the risen Christ is with us and leads us. We might have been slow to try and change the world before, but now that we know Christ is risen, even if it's impossible, outlandish things do happen. And once we believe that, we begin to see possibilities that we never knew before. Faith is a passion. It's a passion for ministry. It's a passion for Jesus. We don't have to rely on our own gifts and abilities and what we're good at. We just get out there and do things. And Jesus is with us in that doing. So as strange as it seems, the resurrection is the basis for faith and our being here and all that we might do together. So remember that. Remember your baptism. Remember that Jesus' presence in the sacraments. Remember that even though we can't see him, he's alive and he's with us. And with our faith comes understanding. And day by day, more and more, we will see Christ who is alive. The Lord is risen. Thanks be to God. Amen.
You may be seated. And let us pray. We give you all praise, honor, and glory, Lord God. We give you all praise, honor, and glory because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And in his dying and rising, we find new life. We find the power of sin and death is broken. We find that you have set us free. And so we give you our praise. But our heads are full of doubts, O God. Like Thomas, we just aren't sure we can believe this proclamation. Like Thomas, we want to see the wounds. We want proof. And there is no proof. There is only faith. We give you thanks for the gift of faith, and we give you thanks that Our faith leads us forward in life and leads us to lessen the importance of our doubts. And so we press forward. We pray for those in the world who do not know that Jesus is risen. We pray for those in foreign lands who've never heard the gospel. And we pray for foreign lands where there is war and fighting. We pray for our soldiers who are in various places around the world and we pray that you bring them home And we pray mostly for peace. We pray that there could be peace. We pray for those who guide us and lead us and govern us. And again, we pray for peace. Peace in our streets, peace in our homes, and peace between neighbors. we pray for your church that it will recognize the role that it has in proclaiming the good news and in making peace and so wherever today you are worshipped we pray for that gathering no matter our differences what unites us is what is important. And finally, we pray for one another. We pray for each other. We pray for all the folks on our prayer list. We pray especially for Scott and Melanie Cranford as Melanie nears the end of her life. But for all of those people, we pray and ask that you will give them healing and give them mercy in whatever form that will take. Lead them to know that you are with them. And for all the other things that weigh our hearts down and and disturb us, make us doubt, for all the things that we can't quite put into words. We lift them, those things, to you as well. We pray in Jesus' name, praying as he taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. You promise your peace through the gift of your Son. Alive with your Spirit, O God, we are sent forth to serve. We offer you now the first fruits of our labor. Accept them and use them in accordance with your desires. Amen.
So go in peace, and as you go, have no doubt the Lord has risen. And as you go, may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you today and every day forever. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.